Morning, BLC. How are we doing this morning? If you can't hear me, it's because my voice, I left it at home in a tree somewhere, so <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. We all like to rise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's raise a hallelujah.
go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty forces, you go before us. Nothing can Thank you. 
We praise you, Father. We worship your holy name. We love you. We thank you, God, for bringing us into your house today where we can do that. We can declare your name and to worship you, Father. There is nothing, there is no one like you, and there is nothing like this experience of drawing together with God's people and worshiping you for who you are, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for this time and for this service. We pray blessings upon every person here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, give it up to God this morning, huh? Give it up. Give it up, Howard said, yeah, keep it going, Howard said, are you for Jesus in your life, huh? All right, praise God, go ahead and have a seat. I'm Pastor Clint, and good morning, I'm the lead pastor here, welcome to Better Life Church, and uh, we are so glad that you're with us today on the third Sunday of January, I just want to mention a couple things here. One is you have a worship guide, and in this, wor this worship guide is designed to help you understand, to worship more and understand more about our vision, our mission, and our values of what we really believe here at Better Life Church. And inside that worship guide is a connection card. And we just ask that you fill this out on Sunday morning. And if you've been here before, maybe your contact information hasn't changed. Maybe there's a prayer request you have. There's a place for prayer requests at the bottom. But if you're here for the first time, we'd love to have you fill that out, give you the hassle-free guarantee that no one's going to show up at your door this week. Uh, but we just want to send you a letter in the mail saying thank you for coming, and here are some next steps. So be sure to, and you can drop that in the offering bucket at the end of the service when we receive our tithes and offerings. So what I want to do right now is I want you to stand. Just take 30 seconds, high five, fist bump somebody, welcome them here, and then look to the screens for the announcements. serve both on our worship team and BLC Kids team. We are so excited to have you in church with us today. One of our favorite things here at Better Life is helping people discover their purpose, and we do that during our monthly growth track. We believe that God gave everyone, every one of us gifts and talents to fulfill the specific purpose he created for us. On the first Sunday of the month, we have growth track at 5 p.m. If you would like to learn more about Better Life's vision, mission, and values, or you want to know about discovering God's purpose for your life, then we invite you to attend this 90-minute class taught by our pastor. Child care is provided for you so you can connect with some of our team leaders. You can learn more about our growth track by visiting betterlifepeople.com. You can register by filling out the connection card and placing it in the offering buckets later in the service. At Better Life, we believe that we are better when we are together, particularly in small groups. We now are entering our second semester of small groups and would like to encourage you to, jo to join a small group of your liking. To learn more about small groups, you can visit betterlifepeople.com or you can complete your connection card for more information, including registering for a group. We are very happy to announce the starting of a popular small group called Financial Peace University. This class is created by Dave Ramsey, one of the world's foremost experts in the area of financial management. Our class will be on Sundays beginning January 22nd at 7 p.m. You can attend a free preview class tonight in the Better Life Church Fellowship Hall at 7 p.m. If you're a member of Better Life Church, we have a special offer for you. If you register, attend, and graduate the class, BLC will refund you half of your registration rate. That's $40 back. To register the class, visit our BLC website and click on the link for Financial Peace University. Our church was started on the belief that before we do anything, we should pray first. Twice a year, we dedicate 21 days of focused prayer, in January and again in August. Our January 21 days of prayer runs from January 8th through January 28th. You can participate in at least a couple ways. First, by receiving our Better Life Daily Devotional to encourage you in your faith and to always pray. Secondly, you are invited to join us each Saturday for our Saturday prayer. 
For the next two Saturdays, we will begin at 10 a.m. You can learn more about 21 Days of Prayer at BetterLifePeople.com. We're so glad to have you with us today, and now here's our pastor to share God's Word with you. service along, so I hope you enjoy that. But uh, today, before I talk about how to have a better life or how to have a blessed life, uh, I just want to do a little follow-up on some of it that you saw. Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace class is here. We're hosting it, and tonight there's a free preview class, and this is all about managing your finances better, getting out of debt, being debt-free, and really, you talk about enjoying a blessed life, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, if you've got payments in your life, then you're probably missing out on a lot, and uh, we, can, we can help you with that to help you become debt-free. When you're debt-free, you can really enjoy, and you can do so many more things with what God puts in your hands when you don't have debt in your life. So anyway, pre-preview class tonight at uh, 7 o'clock. Um, if you want to register, just go to our website, betterlifepeople.com, like she said there, and uh, you, there's a place for small groups and Dave Ramsey's class, Financial Peace, and you can sign up for that through, you sign up through Dave Ramsey's class, and uh, we get the information, um, and it's, it's like $79, and if you attend Better Life Church, and you go to, you pay for it, and you go to all the sessions, and you graduate, then you get half of your money back, okay, that's, that's from our church, okay, we, we, we want to do that, because we want to bless you and believe in that, so anyway, just a little bit about that. So, today, we're talking about a better life, hence Better Life Church, or a blessed life, and when it comes to this, I think of a, a saying that goes like this. That which matters the most must never be at the mercy of that which matters the least. That was Dr. Stephen Covey back in the 1990s. When I was going to Bible college, I was also, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, I was also uh, information systems manager for a company and we did a lot of team building and team training, and we uh, learned a lot from Dr. Stephen Covey, particularly his book, The Seven Habits of Effective People. Not successful people, but The Seven Habits of Effective People. In fact, that, that book is a game, was a game changer for me. I don't know about you, but it was a game changer for me about how to live an effective life. And he also wrote a few other books he called First Things First. And First Things First was about our priorities. And so he used this as an example, and you could probably Google it on YouTube or whatever these days, but uh, I remember uh, in a seminar where he's standing up, and the, uh, he's got this bucket, and there's uh, it's filled with like these grains of like small pebbles and sand, and he tries to put in big rocks, and big rocks represent great, important opportunities in our life, and the smaller pebbles and sand are like time wasters, things that really, don't really add much value, and he had those things in the, bucket, in, the, in the bucket first, and he tried to put the big rocks in, and he couldn't get them all in. But then when he discovered, when we empty it and start all over, when you take the important things, the things of value, like your spiritual life and that kind of thing, you put the big rocks in first, and then when he got all the big rocks in, he was able to pour all the sand and small pebbles, and they all fit in. So when first things first, it's about prioritizing things. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about prioritizing our spiritual life and, and letting Christ be first in our life. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about on the, on the money side, but we're all, on tithing, but we're also going to talk about our life and how we can have a blessed life with our priorities. Now some people freeze up when you start talking about money, 
Do they start thinking that the church wants you to give more, the church wants your money, blah, blah, blah. That's not the case at all. That's not the case at all in the Bible, and that's not the case at all at Better Life. But you must follow me, because what I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to help you. This is a message to help you all the way around. In fact, let me just give you a tidbit, a little pushback. If you've ever thought, well, as a church, they, they talk about money. Did you know that Jesus spoke more about money than he did heaven or, heaven or hell? In fact, there's 500, there's 500 verses on prayer. There's 500 verses about faith. There's 2,000 verses about money and possessions. Jesus spoke 38 parables, and 16 of them were about money. So really, I just want to help you, and, and, and just want to be a blessing to you today, and help you, because how we handle our money reveals our priorities, our loyalties, and our affections. And one person said it this way, I think it was Larry Burkett back in the 1980s, he was, be, he was like the before the Dave Ramsey guy. He used to say that if you look at your checkbook and you look at where the money goes, that will reveal your priorities of what's important to you. See, we want you to know this. God needs to be number one. In fact, he can't be number two. God can't finish second. He'll, he's got to be number one because that's his nature. That's who he is. If Chuck and I went out golfing with God, got on 18 holes, God would always score an 18. He'd get a hole in one in every hole because he can't finish second. That's who he is. So today, what I want to talk to you about are what are the keys of a blessed life? Now you should have message notes. Oh, by the way, good morning to Facebook people who are following us along uh, or YouTube. Uh, but what are the keys then for a blessed life? We're going to look at some principles that we see throughout Scripture that are repeated so you can... Follow along in your message notes. And here's the first principle that I see on this topic of the keys for a blessed life. And that is principle number one, is it sacrificed or redeemed? Is it sacrificed or redeemed? The Lord said to Moses, dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites, the first offspring to be born of both humans and animals belongs to me. So God is saying that the firstborn belongs to him. In fact, 16 times God says that the first belongs to me. In Exodus uh, chapter 13, he goes on to say, You must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. A firstborn donkey may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb, or a young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. So the Old Testament principle is this. The firstborn was to be sacrificed or redeemed. There was no third option. Either sacrifice it or, if it's unclean, redeem it with a clean substitute. Key thought here. The clean firstborn had to be sacrificed, and the unclean firstborn had to be redeemed. Now let's just kind of fast forward to the New Testament, where John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he says in John 1, 29, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus came as the Lamb of God. Now, Jesus in his role, let's, ask, let's see how we do on this. Was Jesus clean or unclean? Clean, all right? And you and I, apart from Christ, it left to our own nature, are we clean or unclean? Unclean, okay? So the principles apply. Jesus was sacrificed to redeem us. He was literally a first through offering, in a very real sense, Jesus was God's tithe. All right? In fact, God gave his tithe in faith before you and I ever believed. That's what it says in Romans 5.8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And we should give our first fruit offerings, our tithes, in the same way. Before we see the blessings of God, we give in faith. That's how God gave Jesus that way. In fact, it says in Romans 8.29, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, 
so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You see, God's legal right, okay, God had a legal right, everything belonged to him. Everything belonged to him. And so if you were to look like, for example, in the Old Testament, now let me give you a theologian's term. Uh, it's a term theologians use, it's, it's using a Greek word. It's called, they would say, like, what is the kerygma? of the Old Testament, and what is the kerygma of the New Testament? The word kerygma means proclamation. It's a Greek word for black proclamation. What was the saving element in the Old Testament? It was the Passover. When the, when the people of Israel, if you remember the movie by Cecil B. DeMille's, or you watch the, the newer uh, movie of the Bible, uh, the people of Israel are coming out of Egypt, and the death angel, is the devourer, is coming through, and it's going to take the firstborn. But what they did was, they knew what God wanted out of them, and that was to slay an animal, to take a perfect lamb, cut its throat, and take the blood, and put the blood over the doorposts and on the sides, and so that when the death angel, the devourer, came through, it passed by, that's where we get, it passed over, that's where we get the word Passover from, it passed over that place. And in the New Testament, Jesus is embodies that picture. Jesus literally went to that cross and gave his rich red royal blood and died on the cross for you and me. And of course, he was not only buried, but he rose and is coming again. That's called the kerygma, the proclamation of the New Testament and the Old Testament. But the thought is this. Any first thing given is never lost. And any first thing not given is always lost. Translated into this, what we give to God, we don't lose because God redeems it for us. Okay, when we when we put it in God's hands, God redeems it for us. But we when we withhold from God, we lose. And Jesus echoes this thought in Matthew 16, 25. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So the importance, like if we're going to talk about tithing, is it acknowledges that God is first. That the first portion is the redemptive portion. The first portion is given to God, and then the rest is redeemed. And you can say that uh, not only about your finances, but you can say that about uh, like attend your life, like attending church, okay? We're here. If you want to have a blessed week, then give God the first day, this is, by the way, this is the first day of the week. This is not the end, even though it's Sunday of a weekend. This is actually the first day of the week. Saturday is the seventh day. This is the first day of the week. What better way to seek the blessings of God than to be in the house of God with the people of God, worshiping God, giving him the first. Amen. You're giving him the first of your week. And it's the same may, maybe of every day. I don't know if you're the type of person, maybe you wake up. And you go, good Lord, it's morning. But maybe you're like me, who well, I love to get up. I tell people the only reason I go to sleep at night is so I can get up in the morning. And you say, good Lord, good morning, Lord. All right? Because you want to give the Lord the first part of your day. Give him the first part of your day. Give him the first part of your week. That's why we do 21 days of prayer. We give God the first day of our year. Because we want the rest to be blessed. Because only God has the ability to bless the rest. You give him the first, he blesses the rest. But when you give somebody else the first part, they don't have the redemptive ability to bless the rest. That's what we're saying here. So the first principle is, is it sacrificed or redeemed? The second principle that we're learning here about peace for a better life or a blessed life is this. Principle number two, first of the first fruits. It says in Exodus chapter 23, 19, as you harvest your crops, Bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord. Not only firstborn, but first fruits. Not only first fruits, but it should be the first of the first fruits. Not just the tenth portion, but the first portion of your first fruits. <clears throat> we bring that to the house of the Lord. We do not give the first to like... A television ministry, you know, uh, to uh, Joyce Meyer. Sorry, Joyce, but you're not going to. And she and she'll be the first to tell you, do not give me your tithe. 
should be the first to tell you, do not bring your tithe. That's an offering. That's above and beyond. Because we give our first because Joyce doesn't have the power to redeem the rest. Only God has the ability to redeem. So we, get, we bring our tithes and offerings, not to some television ministry, not to a parachurch organization, but to the house of the Lord, the local place of worship. It says in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with new wine, with good wine. Honoring God with our possessions and first fruits. Now that was an agricultural society then, Today, the, the roles are different, but the truth is the same. We honor God with our first. And if you, as I've said all along since we launched our church a year ago, it's not about giving. You can't give God anything because he owns everything. It's bringing. We bring what he's put in our hands here on Sunday morning as an off, a, 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 in response to him as an act of worship. Uh, let me just uh, try this, for example. Justin, do you have keys? Car keys? No car keys? You got keys? I probably shared this before, but... Okay, so I've got Landon's keys here. Um, what are we driving, by the way? Uh, GMC Sierra. Ooh, GMC Sierra. See, my Honda hasn't been running very good. Check engine lights on, running rough and all that. And so it's going to go in the... It's, going, it's been in the shop, and this will really help Michelle and I get around. So Landon and Vicki, they um, are letting, giving us the keys here to the, his vehicle. Now... Um, after a while, uh, we get our Honda back, and Michelle and I landed. Um, landed and I, I want to let you know something. We got our vehicle back, but I, other than that, I, I want you to know this. Um, Michelle and I have been praying about this. We want to give you this truck. Okay? <laughs> we want to give this to you. And you've already figured out, Landon's going, give! You can't give it, it's mine! It belongs to me! And that's the same way it is with our finances. They're not, they're, not, they're not yours. It's not yours to decide. I've had people say that to me uh, in, our, in, the, in the history of our church here. In the, the short history of our church, I've had people try to say, well, I'm going to put my giving here, or I'm going to bring it here. It's not your giving. It's God's. And God has already said what we are to do. We are to bring to the house of the Lord the first part, the best. All right? The best. And when we do... God is able to redeem the rest, all right? He favors and he blesses us. See, it's like when the people of Israel came out of Egypt um, and they're entering the new land, they take Jericho. And they took all the possessions out from Jericho and gave it to God. There were no spoils. You know why? Because it was the first city given. God didn't say, conquer ten cities and then give me. They took Jericho, and they gave all the spoils to God, so that after that, God could bless the rest. Now, when they went into Jericho, and here's an example, a man by the name of Achan kept some of the stuff back for himself. And God knew it, and Israel, uh, and so Israel went on to the next city called Ai. Some people think it's Ai, but it's Ai. <laughs> and it was just an easy peanut size of a, of a city, and compared to Jericho, and they should have had no problem. And, of course, they, two things they fail to do is they don't inquire of the Lord about it. And then Achan has kept some back, and they have failure. They're routed. They're defeated by this small little city. And why? And God lets them know, you've got sin in the camp. Achan has taken it. Achan has not returned everything. And it took, of course, Israel was about 2 million people, they feel, at that time. And so God literally stopped them in their tracks, and they went tribe by tribe, clan by clan, family by family, until Achan finally realized, okay, the gig's up, i got to give it back, you know, type of thing. That's, see, God can't, can't bless the rest when we don't put it in his hands. God has the ability to redeem us. And when we don't, the rest is cursed, like it was there. It says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I do not change. And then it says in verse 8 through 11, Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. This is God talking. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me, and the tithes and offerings do me. <clears throat> you are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring, talking to people of Israel, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of armies, 
I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. By the way, this is the only place in Scripture where God says, put me to the test, and it's in the area of finances, okay, of your money, of his money. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease, from the devourer. Your grapes will not fall uh, from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, some people object. They say, no, nah, not so, Pastor. That's Old Testament. Well, listen, it says right here in Malachi, the Lord never changes. See, it's not about law. It's about an unchanging principle throughout Scripture by an unchanging God. And so, you know, it's just like here today we live not under law, but, but the word says under grace. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But let me give an example. In the, in the law, it said, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. You see how the bar has been raised, not lowered, raised. And it's that way in some other uh, places as well. Without exception, I hear people who are regular tithers, they regularly give God their first and their best, tell me how blessed they are. And I hear regularly from non-tithers, one, is I shouldn't have preached a message on Sunday about money, and two, I hear about how they can't afford to give, okay? But see, it's not about the income level. It's not about that at all. It's about who's first in your life. Because God puts things in your life, and what he puts in you, he just asks you to return to him the first and the best. It's not about the income level. It's about, see, because the math doesn't work. The math doesn't work when you, uh, when, you know, people say, well, I can't tie, I can't afford to tie, because then how will I pay all these bills? And so just remember, when you give God the first, he redeems the rest. When you give the electric company the first, they don't have the ability to redeem. And that's why people say, I have more month than money. But God says, when we trust him, he rebukes the devourer. Remember the angel that passed by the Passover? They saw the blood. The people had a regard for that. And it passed by. It did not devour them, did not destroy them, did not kill them. And the same is true in the area of finances. When we give God our first and our best, he takes that redemption and he blesses the rest. Because only God has the power. Not the, mission, not, not the consumer's power. They don't have the ability to do that. Okay? So, and in the Old Testament, if you want some Old Testament pre-law, you just go back to Cain and Abel. When Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, when they were here on earth, it says in Genesis 4 that in the process of time, this is the English Standard Version, Cain brought an offering to the Lord. And I just kind of focused on that for a moment. It didn't say that he brought it right away, he gave God his first. It says in the process of time, he brought an offering. Now here's the full-blown version of that verse. In, verse. in the NIV it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil, didn't say it was the first and the best, as an offering to the Lord. Abel also brought an offering, fat, which when I looked it up in the Hebrew, it means the finest and the best portions from some of the firstborns of the flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. You see, God had respect for Abel, not Cain, because Cain did not give his first fruits. It says in the process of time, when he got around to it type of thing, is he brought some of his fruits. It doesn't say that he brought the best, like Abel. And yet it says in Leviticus, the tithe is our first fruit. It must be first. Leviticus 27.30 says, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. So if I were, to, if I were up here and I had like, uh, let's say um, I, I made a, uh, $1,000 this week, so I've got 10 $100 bills that I just kind of place out here. Which one of those 10 represent the tithe? Because they're all 10%. Which one represents the tithe? The one on the left, the one in the middle, the one on the right? You see, God says that when we give to him and put the first fruits in his hands, he can redeem the rest. But when we don't, it can be cursed. You know, it's possible to give. 
10% and still not be true, doing true biblical tithing, okay? Because the first, the first one taken is the tithe. Because that God says, give me the first. So if I've got 10%, 10%, if I've got 10 bills, it's the first one that we, that's taken there that is given to God that represents the tithe. Not just 10%, the first 10%, all right? And so the Bible says, and so, uh, you know, and we don't want to get real legalistic about this, for example. I know people work and they get, you get direct deposits. So, you know, let's just say I have a direct deposit into my account, and before I have time to write my check out uh, to, the, uh, to the house of the Lord for my tithe, Michelle writes a check to Meyer. Oh, no, we're cursed. You know, she wrote the check to Meyer. Meyer doesn't have the ability to redeem. Okay, that's, we're not getting legalistic like that. What we're, what we're trying to show is this is the design, this is the order, but God checks our heart to know, okay, to know. Tithing first is an act of faith. It says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he, that he is and that he is a rewarder, he rewards those who diligently seek him. And it's a matter of our heart. So we don't want to get legalistic on it. We're trying to teach you the, the principle, and, and we're not going to get all legalistic on it, okay? So according to Exodus 13, the first part redeems the rest. Paul said it this way in Hebrews. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be uh, called, um, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in the figurative sense. See, it's the principle of faith that initiates the blessing. Abraham did not wait until he had ten sons. He offered Isaac, you know. Abraham didn't wait until he had ten sons and then, and then offer up the one that ticked him off the most. <laughs> okay? He didn't do that. He offered up the first one in faith. And God wants us to do that too. Not by how much you would have left, but by faith, trusting that God will take care of the rest. As I said at the outset, our checkbook often shows our priorities. Would you rather go through life with 100% of the money and have none of it blessed, or 90% of the money, knowing that the 10% redeems the rest. Which way would you rather have? See, uh, there was a, I was reading uh, the Barna Report. George Barna does uh, a lot of uh, demographic and statistics in the church world in many different areas. And in the 2022 Barna Report, only 21% said they give 10% or more of their income. While a more, I'm, I'm quoting right now, while a more promising number, most practicing Christians give in a less predictable or lower amounts. Yet according to an earlier study by Gray Matter and Infinity Concepts, Christians give less than they think. Half of the 13% of evangelicals who traditionally tithe give less than 1% of their annual income. The Christian Post stated that if all believers tithe, it would infuse several hundred billions of dollars to resource the kingdom endeavors. Well, here, it, it's not that God needs your money, okay? It's not that at all. But here's the important thing you need to know. God doesn't need you to give. You need to be blessed. All right? God doesn't need you to give. You need to be blessed. So many people do not understand it. But here at Better Life Church, we get it. We understand it. It's such a, in fact, it's such a high priority that we put it into our church constitution and bylaws. What did we put in our bylaws? That the first 10% of our income, of our church's income, goes out to missions. We tithe it before any, before any bill is paid. Before any bill is paid, whether it's people, facilities, whatever, the first 10% goes out to what we call our points of passion, goes to missions, okay? Because we believe that God will then bless the rest, all right? And we miss out on the real blessing. It doesn't matter your income level. It's not about legalism. It's about heart giving God the first place. Paul says... If you want the New Testament, now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, No, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God and his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify they gave not only what they could afford, 
but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and then to us, just as God wanted them to. Give yourself first to the Lord. And so we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and to encourage you to finish the ministry of giving. Here was a poor, struggling church begging for the opportunity to give. There's another uh, fun passage, and I, I call it a fun passage because most people get it turned around. In Luke 12, 31, Jesus is talking and he says, your heart follows your treasure. Now, most people get that reversed. Most people think it's your treasure follows your heart, meaning whatever I have my heart on, my treasure will follow. But that's not what Jesus said. You can, you can check me out on it. In 12, 31 of Luke, he says, your heart follows your treasure, not your treasure follows your heart. What he's saying is that sometimes our heart might not want to <laughs> give that. But when we act in faith, regardless of what our heart does, when we act in faith and we give to God, our heart comes along and realizes how blessed we are. And so our heart follows our treasure. All right? And so uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, now regarding your question about the money being collected to God, for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. See, we believe that here at Better Life Church of giving God our first and our best. And, and I really believe that if every person did that, if every person gave their first and their best to God, that the, the church would be fine, that God, God will bless the rest and he'll take care of us all along the way for everything that we want to do. That's why at Better Life Church, my, my team, because everybody comes from different backgrounds, they've kind of looked at me uh, earlier in the year when I said, we're not doing bake sales. We're not, you know, sell, we're not going out and selling cookies and bake sales in the church uh, because we want to bless the community, all right? We want to give. We want to be known as givers, not receivers. We want to give. In fact, if anything, we want to give people cookies. We want to give people pies. We want to be, we want to be, that, we want to be known as people who give who love to give, okay, who are generous, so we have generosity, see, and so that's what we do, now we do take, there's, the only special offering we do is at Christmas time, our heart for the house offering, and that's above and beyond your tithe, but beyond that, we don't, we don't, we don't try to raise money off of different things, because we believe that, that God, in his plan, with the church and tithing, God's got it covered, okay, God's got it covered, so principle one, is it sacrifice to redeem, Principle two is what I call the first of the first. And principle number three is to pass it down. Is to pass it down. It says in Exodus 13, verses 14 and 15, and in the future, your children will ask you, what does all this mean? And then you will tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go. So the Lord killed all the firstborn males throughout the land of Egypt, both people and animals. That is why I now sacrifice all the firstborn males to the Lord, except that the firstborn sons are always brought back. We are to pass down to generations why we do what we do in the area of giving or tithing. Why do we do it? See, it says right here, pass it down. In the context of the Passover, pass it down. Share it with the other generations so they know. I know uh, my grandson, my oldest grandson is that'll be 23 next month. And we pretty much raised him in our house. He lived with us. And uh, and um, you know we get some we get some good good praise from our family members that Michelle and I did a pretty decent job with him. He's a good kid, Christian young man, got good seeds uh, in his life. 
And when he was as when he was in high school, I think it might have been his junior year, he did the Dave Ramsey thing, and uh, you know, he gets all that. But before, just before that, he saw me writing my tithe check out to the church. His eyes got as big as silver dollars when he saw the amount. And he said, Papa, I'm Papa, Papa and Nana. He says, Papa, why do you give so much? Now, I could have said, oh, the Bible teaches that you're supposed to give 10%. But I wanted to share it with him another way. And I said to him, you've only known me as your papa. You've only known me as a pastor. But I pastored, I, I went into the ministry late in life. I was in my mid to late 30s when I pastored my first church, which would have been 1992 or 1993. He wasn't born until 2000. So he's only known me as his papa and as a pastor. I said, but there was a time when your papa was not a good person. There was a time when your nan and I were dating and we got married young. We were 18 and 16 when we got married with a child on the way and that we were into drugs, into alcohol. Hard to believe that I was a hippie and had long hair with a ponytail in my back. <laughs> Hard to believe that. And... And uh, I got in trouble with the law, broke and entered to a place because we wanted, we were, as a teenager, we were, before I got married, we, uh, some buddies of mine broke in and stole beer because we wanted to go out and party and I got arrested. And so because I was going back to high school, uh, I spent five weekends in the county jail up in White Cloud. On Fridays, my parents would drive me up. I'd go in at four o'clock in the afternoon and I'd get out at six o'clock on Sunday so I could go back to school during the week. And then married young and alcohol, drugs, and coming back one night from Greenville, the Lord really spoke to me. The Lord really spoke to me. I remembered all the verses that my mom taught me growing up about the Lord. And I pulled over. This is March of 1975, so almost 48 years ago. I pulled off at M57 and Lincoln Lake Road. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if my life is a ship, I've been the captain of my own ship and it's shipwrecked. I can't do this anymore. I need you. And he came into my life and turned me around. I did a 180. And, I, and from that point on, from March, March, middle of March 1975 to even now, he has had me on an incline of growth and connecting and getting closer to him and closer to him and closer to him and closer to him. And today, 48 years, I have more fire now than I had back then. Yes, there might be a little snow on the mountain, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of fire in the heart, okay? And, uh, and I have so much more fire and so much more enthusiasm, even than what I did back then. And people thought I had a lot of enthusiasm once the Lord turned my life around. And I'm telling my grandson this because I know what God has done in my life. I know how much he has given. And that's what motivates me to give because I see what God has done in my life. And so I want to give. I love to give. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hilarious giver. I'm a happy giver. I love to give. I just shared with my wife this morning, there's really nothing. If God asked me to give, he's got it because I watch what he's done in my life. And I had a few years ago a little blessing that I'm going to share because it just speaks of who God is. I got a phone call about this time of year, a few years ago, from the aid of a friend of mine who was in the House of Representatives in the state of Michigan. And they said, we would like to have you come and open up the house for the new year by bringing the, the invocation at the, to, to open up the House of Representatives, by bringing the invocation at the start of the year. Can you believe it? The kid that sat in cell block five on White Cloud, <laughs> the kid that was on drugs and alcohol and, and all that, who would have thought that that kid would be leading, here's a picture, be leading the House of Representatives as they open their opening session? Amazing, but God knew. That's what God does. And that's why I give. 
Because God just blesses us so much, you can't help give God. Just give him the first of everything you have. Give him the first of your time. Give him the first of your life. Yes, give him the first of his money that he brings in you. And you'll see a blessed life, a better life, because you can't outgive God. If the worship team wants to come up while I'm closing my ramble here, <laughs> you can't outgive God. Who would have thought? In fact, and the reason it's such a blessing is remember, the first redeems the rest. This was the opening session in January of the House of Representatives. So I got to be the first to pray and lead them in that invocation. And that's why I give. And that's why at Better Life, we never want it awkward. This might, for some, and there's no judgment here. If, if, if you're not a tither type of thing, person, you know, you'll grow. We'll get you there, okay? There's no judgment given. I want you to know that. But what, because what I first need you to do is make sure that you're, you give your heart first to the Lord. Remember, the, the people in the church in Macedonia, they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then the rest came. And as you grow in your faith, I know the rest will come. But we, we talk about giving here and finances. It's a, for some churches, they don't like to deal with it. Uh, two things you don't talk about in church, money and sex, okay? Don't talk about it. Are you kidding me? Those are so important things that we need to talk about in the church. And so I, we just have a great time, and I want you to be comfortable here at Better Life, knowing that we, we talk about it, but not in a judgment manner, but in a faith manner. And sometimes I'll have people say to me, oh, Pastor, I couldn't make it to small group you know, this week because I had to work a few extra hours. And I said, awesome, great, you're going to get overtime. That's going to be a tremendous tithe. Woohoo! You know, great, you know. That's how we have to look at it. Let's have the jar filled, overflowing. That's how our God is, not half full. So, looking at the three principles in this morning. How about a little mood music here? I'm trying. Okay. Uh, the three principles then are this. About the keys to a blessed life. Is it sacrificed or is it redeemed? Is it the first of our first fruits? And then when we see God blessing in our life, then we pass it down and share the blessings of God with other people. Share with your kids. I've shared with my grandson. I've shared with my kids. I've shared with you about why I'm such a giver. Because God is the greatest giver. And I know what he's done in my life. And then I've seen the blessings. I've actually seen God rebuke the devourer in my life. And you can't outgive give God. It's just more and more. So it's wonderful. Sacrifice to redeem, first of the first. Let's make sure we pass it down. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. God, we just love you so much. And Lord, I know we spoke about money. And we're okay with that because Jesus taught more about money than in heaven or hell. And I want every person, Father, here to know that we do not judge anybody. We just want to give the biblical insight and teaching. And every person needs to connect with you on that matter. But more than anything, God, do I want from our church and from everyone here is that they'll look at their life and make sure God is first in every area of their life, whether it's finances, whether it's their area of work and their family, the Lord, that you get the first portion of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never even given the Lord any place in your life or heart. You've never asked him to come in? This morning you can. What a great, what a great morning to place your faith in Christ and to give him first place in your life. If you've never asked Christ this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, you can just say, Lord, I've heard what the pastor has to say. I might not get all of it, but I know this, I need you. I want a blessed life. And I know it starts with Jesus. I know this much that I need to let you know, God, that yes, I, I'm not perfect, but I know Jesus is. And I'm asking Jesus, Jesus, come into my life. And you can pray that right now while I'm praying it. And you can just say, me too, Lord. Jesus, come into my life. 
I want you to have first place in my life. I'm going to be a new person, a new creation. I'm going to enjoy the blessings of, of you. I'm committing my life to you today with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed that maybe this morning in your own way, just share that with me by raising your hand. Does it want this morning? Perhaps this morning that uh, you've just never really thought about giving God first place in this way in every area of your life. And so as we enter 2023, this morning, you're just going to recommit. You're going to say, God, I want to get closer to you. And getting closer to you means I want to give you first in every area of my life. I know Jesus as my Savior, but I really want, from this point on, I want you to have first place in my heart. Receive from me my openness and come into my life and fill my life with blessings because I'm going to live for you, giving you first place in my heart and life. With their head bowed and eyes closed, is there anybody here that recommitted their life today saying, I want you to have first place in my life? Yes, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you honor and glory. Um, Lord, we just we just give you everything in our life. And uh, we want you to well, we want you to take it and redeem it. So that we are our the devourer is rebuked and we enjoy a blessed life. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so ushers get ready to receive our tithes and offerings. Uh, we just want to re remember to fill out the connection card, drop it in the offering bucket. It's going to come by in a minute. Do that, and we would love to uh, connect with you uh, as well. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had in this service. Father, I just pray for these times and offerings that we are bringing to you. They're yours. We're just bringing them to you in the act of faith. We pray you bless it. Bless these offerings, God, and bless every person who gives their first and their best, rebuke the devourer, help us, Lord, to see the enjoyment of a blessed life. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, as yes, we come by, why don't you go ahead and stand, and the worship team will lead us in this last song.
scripture you've got the uh the dave ramsey thing and then also we have uh at the end of the service here we got two if you need prayer please come on up we'll have chuck and don you guys have a wonderful week we all love you god bless you